Module 2, Opportunities for Pursuing Integrated Approaches to Climate Change, Disasters, and Sustainable Development, and Finding Common Ground. In this module, we will discuss opportunities for pursuing integrated approaches to climate change, disasters, sustainable development, and finding common ground. Given the potential benefits of integrated approaches to adaptation, sustainable development, and disaster risk reduction, this module will highlight several opportunities to pursue policy integration to the three post-2015 frameworks, as well as how to assist the implementation of supporting activities. In this module, we will look at three units, Introduction to Resilience and Ecosystems, Common Scopes, Cross-Sectoral and Multi-Scale, Common Objectives, and Common Opportunities to Foster Policy Integration, and Finding Common Ground between the Paris Agreement and the Sendai Framework. Climate change, disaster risks, and development are interrelated. A high degree of vulnerability to exposure is primarily caused by poor developmental practices such as rapid demographic changes, environmental mismanagement, and rapid and unplanned urbanization. Disasters slow down development and destroy physical infrastructures and or worsen development processes. Recovery and reconstruction after a disaster, along with disaster risk reduction, require development investment, which in turn requires energy. If energy is not clean energy, development investment with energy consumption leads to a large amount of greenhouse gases. Increases in greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere lead to anthropogenic climate change, which over the long term is projected to increase the frequency and intensity of natural hazards. Increases in natural hazards will lead to increases in disaster risks without the proper management of exposure and vulnerability. Therefore, the proper management of disaster risk is directly critical for development processes, but also indirectly essential for addressing climate change. Climate change affects disaster risks in two ways. First, short-term climate variability and its extremes directly affect the magnitudes and frequency of hazards and the shocks which society has to cope with. Over the past decades, research has shown an increase of strong tropical cyclones, especially over East and Southeast Asian countries. In 2021, the World Economic Forum indicated that, during the last four decades, there has been a notable increase of tropical cyclone inland impacts over the studied regions. Future projections show that by the end of the 21st century, Western North Pacific tropical cyclones could have doubled in destructive power over inland regions. Because of these changes, unprecedented extreme weather and climate change events might occur. Second, longer term changes in climate will influence productive activities, assets, and capital of society, particularly in natural resource dependent economies. If society's productivity, such as in an agricultural economy, or social capital deteriorates due to climate change, the society might become more vulnerable to natural hazards that a stronger economy could help manage. In this case, long-term change in climate negatively affects society's coping capacity, which leads to an increase in disaster risk. On the other hand, because climate change and DRM are interlinked, successful mitigation of anthropogenic climate change can mitigate disaster risk in both direct and indirect ways. Direct influence comes from reducing weather-related uncertainty and hazards from lessening asset depletion in societies that are dependent on natural resources. Indirectly, effective mitigation increases asset availability that can be allocated to mitigate disaster risks and build resilience. Whilst climate change actions and disaster risk management are distinct issues, there are a number of overlaps and common elements. For example, the most effective way of simultaneously addressing climate change adaptation and disaster risk management is to reduce vulnerability. Also, the knowledge of climate-related disaster risk management can enhance the understanding and actions in international climate change negotiations on loss and damage mechanisms. The loss and damage mechanism is the main apparatus under the UN Climate Convention for dealing with irreversible losses and costly damages caused by climate change, which are considered beyond the adaptability ability of countries. The common themes of all three agendas provide several important opportunities to integrate adaptation, sustainable development, and disaster risk reduction. Firstly, resilience features strongly in all three agendas, although usage varies slightly in each context. While the Paris Agreement does not provide a definition of resilience, a special report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, Managing the Risks of Extreme Events and Disasters to Advance Climate Change Adaptation, defines it as the ability of a system and its component parts to anticipate, absorb, accommodate, 
or recover from the effects of a hazardous event in a timely and efficient manner, including through ensuring the preservation, restoration, or improvement of its essential basic structures and functions. Developed specifically for adaptation, this definition suggests that resilience can include both the ability to recover from a hazardous event and the opportunity to improve or adapt forward. Meanwhile, the Sendai framework uses the definition of resilience developed by the United Nations Office for Disaster Risk Reduction. The ability of a system, community, or society exposed to hazards to resist, absorb, accommodate, adapt to, transform, and recover from the effects of a hazard in a timely and efficient manner, including through the preservation and restoration of its essential basic structures and functions through risk management. This definition has many of the same core elements as the definition mentioned earlier, however, does not refer to future improvements. The SDGs do not provide a definition of resilience, but use the term in connection with climate action and disaster risk reduction targets, which leaves room for interpretation based on national context and the particular SDG. Despite these differences, resilience may be useful as a unifying concept for adaptation, sustainable development, and disaster risk reduction. By putting resilience at the core of planning, actors can pursue solutions that contribute to all three global agendas. Sectoral approaches to planning that are centered on resilience provide an opportunity to foster better policy integration. Additionally, ecosystems play a central role in each of the three global agendas. Ecosystem-based adaptation has emerged as an important concept within the adaptation dialogue. It encourages the conservation, sustainable management, and restoration of ecosystems to help people adapt to the impacts of climate change. Similarly, SDG 15 addresses life on land with a strong focus on ecosystems, while support is increasing for ecosystem-based approaches to disaster risk reduction that apply ecosystem-based solutions such as the conservation, restoration, and the sustainable use and management of land, wetlands, and other natural resources in disaster and climate risk management. Like resilience, ecosystems can function as a common concept that encourages further integration between adaptation, sustainable development, and disaster risk reduction. People and communities play a central role in each of the three global agendas. They benefit from the action, have the opportunity to innovate and lead on new ideas, galvanize neighbors and other groups, and lead through example. A people-centered approach to adaptation, sustainable development, and disaster risk reduction creates opportunities to pursue integration and actions that benefit all three agendas. One instance of a successful people-centered approach is the typhoon-resistant housing program in the Philippines. After Typhoon Sisang in 1987, which completely destroyed over 200,000 homes, the Department of Social Welfare and Development instigated a program of providing typhoon-resistant housing for those living in the most typhoon-prone areas. Core shelter houses are designed to withstand wind speeds of 180 kilometers per hour. They have the following typhoon-resistant features. Anchorage tying the roof to the ground through cement footings to achieve continuity, a four-sided roof design strengthened by roof trusses, extra bracing and anchoring on walls and ceilings to ensure stability. The shelter itself is quite small, measuring 3 by 3.5 meters. There are four wooden corner posts attached to concrete pedestals partially sunk into the ground and four wooden side posts situated midway on each wall similarly attached to concrete pedestals partially sunk into the ground. These firm footings, together with the secure anchorage of the superstructure, help to ensure that the dwelling remains firm during typhoons. Costs are kept down by using cheap, locally available materials for roofing, walling, and flooring, since these are not essential to the wind resistance of the dwelling. An essential aspect of the design is that it should be easy to understand and build, which is why it's acceptable to local people who can be trained in simple construction methods. The technology can be easily transferred without the need for lengthy and complicated training courses. All aspects of the house design and appearance, apart from the essential design aspects relating to wind resistance, are left to the individual beneficiaries to develop as they wish. A people-centered approach highlights that farmers do not pursue adaptation, sustainable development, and disaster risk reduction separately, but rather address them all at once as they work to improve their livelihoods. This provides an opportunity to learn directly from vulnerable people about the actions that may best contribute to all three agendas at once. Communities are also critical agents of change for all three agendas. Local actors can often drive processes at higher levels of policymaking. The 100 Resilient Cities Initiative, pioneered by the Rockefeller Foundation, 
and the Making Cities Resilient campaign, supported by the United Nations Office for Disaster Risk Reduction, are important examples of this. They focus on bottom-up resilience building in urban areas across the globe. The 100 Resilient Cities Initiative has created a network of 100 cities that works to reduce the risk of disasters while also working to address many of the root causes of vulnerability. Activities are designed to reduce poverty, improve the provision and use of public transportation, and prevent water and food shortages, among other things. As of September 2017, the Making Cities Resilient campaign had more than 3,600 cities worldwide committed to implementing the priorities outlined in the Sendai framework and working towards reaching the seven targets of the framework at the local level. These include Target E, which refers to the adoption of local disaster risk reduction strategies by 2020. These cities are poised to become leaders on climate action in their countries and can enhance ambition for all three global agendas. Communities can also act as agents of change when working independently. Activities that increase resilience to climate change, support sustainable development, and reduce disaster risk often have high upfront costs with low financial returns on investment. Financial and technical assistance can be instrumental in enabling communities to achieve their goals, wherever the support may come from. By recognizing the potentially transformative role of communities in contributing to the three post-2015 agendas, there is an opportunity to support further integration between the three agendas. As with vulnerable individuals, supporting communities will help to encourage policy integration based on effective actions identified at the community level. Overall, because of the common themes, scopes, and objectives of the three post-2015 global agendas, there are several opportunities to foster integration between adaptation, sustainable development, and disaster risk reduction. Governments are increasingly recognizing the benefits of greater coherence in CCA and DRR, exemplified by the number of countries that either have developed joint strategies or put in place processes that facilitate coordination across the two policy areas. Coherence is a means to integrate the pursuit of CCA and DRR in sustainable development through coordination. It can be operationalized horizontally across sectors, vertically at different levels of government, and through collaboration across stakeholder groups. Three main types of coherence can be identified, strategic, operational, and technical. Realizing the benefits of increased coherence in CCA and DRR requires political support and strong leadership by a recognized coordination entity. Awareness raising and capacity development are also important in ensuring that the benefits and trade-offs of greater coherence are well understood by key stakeholders and guide the identification of shared solutions. With the implementation of CCA and DRR often occurring at the local or sector level, ministries and agencies with a presence at these levels should lead to increased coherence. However, this depends on the availability of the required human, institutional, and financial capacities to facilitate such coordination. In some countries, capacities are stretched due to competing demands generated both by the separate CCA and DRR frameworks and processes, as well as by other development priorities. CCA and DRR also have strengths that can build upon each other. The historically established approach to DRR can offer lessons and entry points for CCA. The international focus on climate change brings resources and political profiles to CCA that can also be leveraged for DRR. This e-learning module identified enabling factors and approaches that promote coherence based on country case studies. This provides the basis for a set of actionable ways forward not only targeting the government officials in the three case study countries, but also those in other countries, as well as providers of development cooperation. The responsibilities for coordination and the responsibilities of climate change adaptation and disaster risk reduction policies need to be aligned. This can be done by ensuring ministries and agencies at the national level have information and incentives to integrate CCA and DRR across their portfolios and report back on progress centrally. Making use of ministries and agencies with a presence at the local level and responsible for implementation to ensure that national directives on CCA and DRR are integrated with local development plans. Reinforcing the mandate of relevant ministries and agencies to enforce existing regulatory measures and provide incentives in support of CCA and DRR, such as land use management, and environmental protection. Building on international momentum on CCA policies to also bring domestic attention and resources to the reduction of climate-related disaster risks and specifically risk prevention measures. The past decade has seen a shift in emphasis from assessing climate and disaster hazards 
to understanding their risks better. Despite this, there continues to be a gap in exposure and vulnerability data. Two key dimensions of risk, compared to hazard data, with the former often spread across ministries and levels of government. Another barrier is human and technical capacity to access, generate, and use the data and information available. To overcome these challenges, incentives must be put in place to encourage owners of data to make it accessible. Centralized platforms with access to data and information, including risk models, observation systems, and academia can facilitate robust risk assessments tailored to user needs. Another priority should be to strengthen the capacities of stakeholders to use the data to conduct risk analysis, especially at the local level, to help decisions on CCA and DRR navigate the uncertainties found in climate projections, climate data should also be complemented with information on other ecological, economic, and social factors that drive exposure and vulnerability. This in turn can help local stakeholders accept CCA and DRR measures. Further, climate services are most effective when matched with tools that can translate climate information into a format that can guide decision-making processes and recognize broader drivers of risks such as population growth and urbanization. Here are a few actions that can be taken moving forward. Make tailored climate information readily available to support evidence-based policies. Provide support or incentive mechanisms to encourage owners of data to make climate information easily accessible for users at all levels. Where appropriate, converge risk assessment methods across sectors to support coherent decision-making on CCA and DRR on the ground. Put further emphasis on generating comprehensive information on current vulnerability and exposure and layer this with information on future hazards. This information is inherently uncertain and requires careful interpretation. Ensure there are channels for locally collected data on vulnerability to contribute to the wider understanding of vulnerabilities. Political commitment to greater coherence in CCA and DRR does not always translate to implementation. Institutional bodies with a mandate to coordinate often do not have the mandate to implement and fund. Capacity constraints, human and financial, contribute to these barriers, particularly at the local level where most implementation occurs. Lack of coherence at higher levels of government can also lead to conflicting or duplicative demands at the local level. Instead, considerations of climate and disaster risks should guide all policy processes. Similarly, a range of common policy instruments, such as land use management, building codes, and infrastructure standards, can contribute to joint CCA and DRR outcomes. Strengthening the capacity to enforce these policies, standards, and regulations can therefore be effective in managing and reducing risks, such as limiting the construction of infrastructure in areas highly vulnerable to climate and geophysical hazards. When there is insufficient political backing to implement identified CCA and DRR measures, or to integrate these considerations into all processes, Theoretically, resilience can be reinforced with post-disaster response. The trade-off between the urgency of a quick recovery and the need for robust risk assessments to incorporate climate considerations may limit this in practice. How should we address this? Enhance capacity to translate coherence in planning into coherence in the implementation. Support local governments in implementing national directives on CCA and DRR. For example, provide incentive and review mechanisms as well as guidance, tools, and checklists. Understand the constraints on local CCA and DRR priorities and capacity, recognize the challenges to continuity building capacity, and tailor efforts accordingly. Provide tools and strengthen the capacity of stakeholders, especially at the local level, to combine climate information with other ecological, economic, and social factors that drive risks in a way that supports robust decision-making on CCA and DRR. Facilitate peer learning on good practices to common challenges among local governments. Investment in coherent implementation of CCA and DRR requires multiple sources and instruments of finance, as well as consideration of different timescales. This often involves complex decision-making on where, to whom, and how much finance should be allocated. Risk assessments and economic analysis can provide useful information for the prioritization of funding allocation to measures that can foster coherence in CCA and DRR. Yet, the feasibility and quality of these assessments and analyses depend on the capacities of the actors responsible for planning and the availability of information on climate and disaster risks. Greater clarity in financial management can also help governments promote greater coherence in CCA and DRR, 
Existing budgeting tools and guidelines, such as budget codes for CCA and DRR, can help identify funding gaps and priorities for public investments. Grants that target coherence can also create incentives for focusing on CCA and DRR across sectors and levels of government, especially when there is high demand for scarce resources for competing developmental priorities. Piloting different financial instruments, sometimes with support from development partners, can support the development of solid risk financing strategies to respond to the impacts of climate-related disasters. However, for pilots like these to succeed, they must include clear exit, replication, or scale-up plans. Over time, they provide valuable opportunities for relevant stakeholders to build capacity and identify examples of good practice. Some actions to take moving forward. Optimize long-term funding allocation across different risks through budgeting tools, ex-ante financing plans, and greater transparency in public spending. Make use of financial management tools, risk assessments, and economic analysis to support budget allocation for CCA and DRR. Improve transparency in national and subnational public spending to identify areas for improvement in coherence between CCA and DRR, and review the results to future financial decision making. Establish ex-ante financing plans, including approaches for financial protection that ideally factor in potential public disaster costs and identify financing options for response, recovery, and rehabilitation. With this, we end Module 2. Please click on the next video to continue our learning.